Hello, welcome. I am actually presenting on, here we go. Um, I hope this works. Okay. Transforming grief into art and political action, the LGBT community. I wanted to touch upon the, the fact that we've learned how um, important community is in all of these rituals that we've learned about in the mourning process and the grieving process of so many different cultures. And um, the uniqueness of the kinds of trauma and the way it connects to grief and loss with the LGBT community and other marginalized, discriminated against communities is very important and central to being able to listen and help heal and guide someone to a place of acceptance. Um, you need to be aware if you have an LGBTQ person in your office, in your room, asking for help that there are unique needs and there are unique stressors uh, that uh, they are dealing with likely on a variety of levels, a variety of types of trauma. And there are real uh, roadblocks and problems with being able to mourn and grieve the same as heterosexuals when they may not be recognized. Uh, gay marriage may not have may not be legal where they are, it may not be possible, they may be grieving the loss of a spouse, and um, who's not, who the spouse's family would, would never accept the relationship. Um, they may be in the closet because of just, and um, unsure how to go about grieving. So trauma, is, as we've learned, is intertwined with grief and loss. But these are some unique, things that an LGBT person might be working through that um, heterosexuals may not be, um, the, that they've lost contact with family members, that they were excommunicated or disowned by friends and family. They've lost membership in the church or community because if, say, they were Catholic, um, it would they're considered an abomination to God and not, not a member of the church any longer. Uh, they may be in the closet because they know that there's homophobia in the powers that be above them and in, in the workplace they would probably lose a promotion. Even though it's harder to fire someone for being gay, it still happens. Uh, the basic level of loss of freedom that can start and with dignity and self-respect, the loss of that happens. They're already grieving that often from the time they were young children and they learn to have to hide parts of who they are to avoid bullying or to avoid a parent from beating the gay out of them. The, if they're dealing with the grief and loss of a loved one or a spouse or a partner, same-sex partner, um, hospital workers, and may not recognize the relationship, and may not understand how to. They may not be allowed in the hotel room because they're not, I mean in the hospital room because they're not considered immediate family. This has happened so many times, especially going back to the 80s with the AIDS crisis, just before there were any rights, uh, any like same-sex partnership or civil partnership rights. And, um, Families just would kick the significant other out of the hotel, out of the hospital room, and they would be left out of just decision making and in funeral arrangements. So this could be a real fear, um, adding to the grief and loss and the self and the trauma that a person in your office is going through. If someone is transgendered, hopefully you already understand that they're the most marginalized, most discriminated against. Um, Today, I mean, we're just, just we're still fighting and talking about their rights to healthcare or the use of a bathroom on the most basic level. Their dignity and and self respect is uh, is lost continuously. Uh, the level 
of suicide is um, incredible in the transgender community. Um, there's something called the minority stress model that uh, positions that uh, there are certain objective and subjective stressors that members of that minority group are experiencing on a daily basis, sometimes since childhood, victimization, harassment, uh, discrimination, it's expectations of rejection, and then internalized homophobia, the, the, the idea that some people actually believe that they're not worth it, that they're an abomination to God. They come to take on the heteronormal attitudes and the heterosexism of the culture and believe it. So they may not feel worthy of, of, of their own grief, uh, that, that they have a right to it or to express it, their anger, on the path to acceptance. So there's an acute single incident trauma, as we know, and this could be, since it's a catastrophic single event, I mean, we're talking the AIDS crisis and the, that wiped out a generation of, of people on such a, a massive global scale and the government's failure to respond for years and years or to fast track the approval of drugs that could have saved so many lives simply because it was a gay disease. And it was, you know, many people believed and the Reagan administration never admits this, but may have believed that, you know, they asked for this. This is God's punishment. Um, a lot of the, the help didn't start to come until it started to impact other communities the, of intravenous drug users and heterosexuals. And they realized it was a real health problem. But um, surviving that plague, the gay plague, could be an acute single incident trauma that someone is dealing with. I, they may have lost friends um, and have never gotten over that. And now they're in your office um, dealing with another, another loss. Um, repetitive trauma, the, cr the chronic events that happen, the constant discrimination and victimization, the harassment, the fear of, of an expectation of rejection and of, of homophobia and hate thrown in your face at any moment continues and continues. Um, it can turn into complex trauma because these cumulative traumatic events, maybe your father tried to beat the gay out of you when you were a kid and then your friends and peers bullied you. And this is a very common story, one that I can relate to uh, for years and years in school every day. Um, and then you become an adult and you lose your partner to, in 1990 to AIDS. And then after this, I mean, by this time you have PTSD combined with a severe depressive disorder and anxiety disorders. And these are building over a lifetime. Um, it's complex trauma. And, but now we have, you know, incidents where people are talking about how microaggressions, just the simple awareness that you're being discriminated against or you're being disrespected or you're being, as a, as, as a LGBT person, you're treated differently. Uh, you're looked at differently. Um, and it happens in small ways every day. That is, um, that is just a given for this community, pretty much. How, just like it is for the African American community or any p people of color who are just know that they're treated differently everywhere they go. Things are said that with undertones of racism and homophobia, and often the people saying it don't even understand what they're saying or that it's so obvious. Uh, but um, vicarious trauma is the last thing that affects a lot of this community because a lot of us come together to fight for each other. We have to mobilize together when something happens to one, it's like it's, it's happened to all of us because we know it could have been us. 
Um, this happened, you know, with Matthew Shepard, the 22 year old white college student in 1998, who was uh, being tied up to a fence by two boys who met him in a bar, pretended to be gay and be interested in taking him home. And he went with them in their truck and they were not gay. They were looking to get him somewhere alone and beat him and torture him. And they tied him to a fence and left him for dead. And he did die in the hours the next morning. Um, and he became a symbol for many of us because it, it, he looked like many of us. And it could have been me. And it's not like the, you know, the thought doesn't cross your mind when you're meeting people even. In, so, in, in bars or social events, you know that there's a chance that someone's posing as gay so that they can take you somewhere and actually kill you. And transgender people deal with this all the time. Murders happen constantly. And no, are, are they people just disappear? And that's currently happening in Chechnya, in Russia right now. And Putin denies that it's happened. The United Nations has uh, asked him to investigate again and again. And he keeps coming back and saying, we did investigate and it's not happening. Well, there's a documentary on HBO right now called Welcome to Chechnya. And it proves that it is happening. Families are killing their fa own family members and they're just disappearing off the face of the earth because it's uh, unacceptable it's, uh, it's to be uh, LGBT and Chechnya. They, you're not allowed to exist and you're killed and you just disappear and no one talks about it. Um, so anyways, all of these things are running through the back of the mind often of many of us who are members of the LGBT community and in 1969, now I'm, I'm, for the rest, I'm going to try to speed up and just go through examples now of in the face of all this discrimination and all this inability to perhaps mourn the way that normal people who are uh, not normal, I shouldn't say that heterosexuals do, you know, there are all these wonderful rituals that you can choose from based on your religion going back to ancient times. Yet, like I said, if you're LGBT, you may not even have the right to, um, you may not even have access to family or church or community in that sense, in that traditional sense at all. So what happens over the course of time? How do we as a community move? Well, you know, what I'm gonna show you is that through art and activism, a sense of family and community has developed among the LGBT community. And we have developed our own unique ways of grieving and mourning and turning it into a celebration of hope and activism and change. And we use art most of the time because we have so many artists in our ranks, uh, not just artists who are doing a collage or uh, you know, writing a journal to memorialize and help get to that place of acceptance in the grieving process. But we're talking, you know, world renowned artists and their allies are, um, our allies are world renowned artists as well. And so tends to be kind of high profile and get attract a lot of attention. But the Stomo riots kicked off modern times the LGBT civil rights struggle because it used to be the police could, could just go in and raid a bar or a gathering of gay people. You weren't allowed to exist. You weren't allowed to come together. It was illegal. And in 1969, when they attempted to raid the Stonewall Bar in Greenwich Village, New York City, they fought back. And it was mostly um, people of color and, and drag queens or transgender folks in the bar. So they were the ones on the front lines fighting back with the police, eventually arrested, but it kicked off so much attention and a series of riots and demonstrations and a whole movement 
to demand that this kind of discrimination stop. And two years later, the first New York City Gay Pride Parade was called Christopher Street Gay Liberation. 50 years later, well, last year, this is the Gay Pride Parade. Millions, and many of them, mostly actually straight allies and family members and friends showing their support for the rights of LGBT people to take back their dignity and their self-respect and just their right to exist and walk down the street and sit down in a bar with their friends. Um, of course, that has expanded into many other fights for gay marriage, other kinds of equality. Um, however, in 1972, as these demonstrations were first beginning, an activism was a response to grief and, and a part of the mourning process. This happened, a woman, a mother, who, uh, darn, I have my papers just out of order. Anyways, I know it. It's in 1972, this woman in the front here, her son was killed, um, because he was handing out flyers for a gathering and a march and a demonstration and he was attacked and beaten to death on the street. And she, uh, much like what happens to transgender folks often still today, and it's comparable to the lynchings that happened back in last century um, for people of color. Um, but it's not, this is 1976 when uh, four years after her son was killed, she has now created PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, which is now a nationwide and worldwide organization with chapters everywhere. Opportunities for parents and family members to come together and march and demonstrate to fight discrimination and hate towards the LGBTQ community. Um, and she did this, this is her, she turned her mourning and grief into activism. And shortly after in the early eighties, as we know, we survived the AIDS crisis, but we didn't, many didn't survive. And for years, the government didn't respond and didn't want to rush or approve drugs that would have saved millions of lives because it was considered a gay disease uh, by many. The Reagan administration, yeah, you know, a lot of the attitude was, you know, they brought this on themselves and this is God's punishment. Um, they weren't responding at all and they were not acknowledging that there was a plague or a health crisis even happening for years. It took mobilizing, it took losing friend after friend after friend, community member after community member, and a man named Larry Kramer to mobilize the community to fight back and start demanding that the government first just accept that there's a health crisis and it's a, and a, and a health uh, situation and it's a plague and it's a pandemic that's affecting um, a community. And, uh, this is Larry Kramer, probably the most famous AIDS activist. He lost a partner and countless friends while he was slowly putting together a variety of organizations. One GMHC takes care of and tries to find health benefits and health uh, care for those HIV positive, but ACT UP and Queer Nation were organizations that were designed for activism to march on the streets, to crowd City Hall and stage protests and demonstrations. And he's written many books and he wrote a play about the whole experience of the early, when his first, when they first noticed that there was a, a gay cancer in the community in the early eighties and the story of how he became an activist as he was losing his lovers and his friends and his, the love of his life also. 
And this is being performed still the normal heart 30 years after the original 1985 production. And there's an HBO movie version if you ever get the chance to see it. It's pretty phenomenal, amazing. Um, by 1993, we're marching on Washington, million strong. It continues to grow, the, the size of the marches and the size of the pride events that are designed to take back your, your dignity and your self-respect and to remember those we've lost to gay violence and to the AIDS crisis. Some of these works, like I said, we have some talented folks. This is a Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award winning production of Angels in America by Tony Kushner. It's performed in the first in the 90s and is still being performed as a classic. And there is also a movie on HBO starring Meryl Streep. Uh, if you can't see the actual theatrical production, I was there in one of the front rows when it premiered in New York with the original cast and it was spellbinding. Um, even Academy Award winning films talking about the HIV and AIDS, the plague that we survived, um, the impact that discrimination had on our community. Tom Hanks won the Academy Award for his portrayal of an HIV positive lawyer who contracts AIDS and is fired from his job and he fights back and he uh, wins um, benefits for his partner. Um, and um, this is an example of arts and crafts, art therapy. Well, we do it in a big way, the LGBT community, like we do everything in a big way. Um, Some say that, you know, because we've always been so mar marginalized and treated as so different and denied access to the normal ways that people do things, like, you know, ostracized from it by the church is by a religion that we, we've had to create our own rituals. And we, they tend to be big and over the top, some say. Some say that a lot of it, you know, because it gets attention when, when a drag queen is lip syncing at a memorial service. But um, it's how we, we say pay attention to what's happening to us. Um, there's a quote um, from one of my sources here that says that, you know, if there's a distinctive power to queer grief, it lies in the style of mourning that emerged from queer cultures over time. These styles set the shape and tone of the activism that comes out of grief. And activism, of course, is itself a style of mourning. And, you know, when, um, when we grieve, we do um, tend to do it in a big way. And um, grow, grow together towards a common goal. Um, this is the AIDS quilt. The reason why this happened is because um, when people started dying of AIDS, they were denied burials and funeral homes would not take their bodies. Um, and there were not places and family members would, you know, like I said before, uh, not allow significant others and friends to even be invited to the funerals. Um, I came across countless stories of both men and women experiencing that, um, being not allowed, not invited to the funeral of a partner that they lived with for 15 years, 20 years. So, they started, a group of men started making patches 
And this is the AIDS quilt. You can see it, it up close as some of them. And uh, it's currently 54 tons. It's the largest piece of community folk art in the world. And there are over 48,000 individual memorial panels. And it's usually combined, that art is combined with activism because when it is displayed, it's usually to raise money for causes that are current, fighting for social justice and equality, fighting for AIDS, money for AIDS research, um, raising money. Back to, I was telling you about how personally affected I was by Matthew Shepard because he was a 22 year old white college student that looked like me and I, I had just graduated from college and I felt that that could have happened to me. Um, I was very traumatized by, um, by his death, but his parents in their mourning and grief, they didn't just join PFLAG, which they could have. Uh, they started nonprofits themselves that were that were dedicated to um, educating school systems, teachers um, about the different unique kinds of traumas that LGBT students do, about how high the suicide rate is for um, LGBT youth. Um, as a matter of fact, this is a true Hmm. It's at least three times the um, the suicide rate of heterosexual youth, and LGBT youth are almost five times as likely to have attempted suicide as heterosexual youth. And um, these are facts from the CDC. Um, these are uh, statistics, and it. Transgender adults report, 40% of them report having made a suicide attempt. 40% of the transgender community, 92% of those who have attempted suicide did so before the age of 25. And so in the process of grieving and mourning, the parents of Matthew Shepard created many projects and been involved in many projects and nonprofits to do something about that. There was also a play that's still performed today, an award-winning play called The Laramie Project, 20 years later. This is a production 20 years after Matthew Shepard's death. That's a photograph. And then finally, my last thing is the Pulse nightclub, the Orlando shootings that happened in 2016. And there's a lot of articles and, and um, research talking about the uniqueness of gay and lesbian grief and transgender grief, that it tends to be a very loud celebration. Even after this happened, that in that very nightclub, there was a memorial a few days later, and it was a drag show. And people were dancing all through the night through their tears, there were drag queens lip syncing songs that we all know as gay anthems that are all about strength and hope. And you cannot, you can knock me down and I'll get back up again. Famous songs as varied as I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor to, um, you know, I Rise Up by Anya Day, who, uh, you know, apparently there was, there's a drag, um, lip sync version of that that was performed at the Pulse nightclub a couple days later that had everyone in tears, but then dancing the night away, honoring the 49 angels, the 49 that were killed. And then there's the 49 portraits. A different artist painted a portrait of each one of the 49 victims, the Orlando Pulse shooting, and it moves around like the AIDS quilt moves around. Um, when it's displayed, it's usually in connection with activism, raising money um, for current causes that are 
moving us towards gay marriage, equality, social justice. And then some interesting things have said that uh, about the gay community is that they're famous for, for growing their grief and their mourning and taking it into a place of action. And after the Orlando Pulse shootings, there have been articles that I uh, used as research for this that uh, describe how, uh, is it going to be the gay community that actually fights gun control and gets somewhere doing so? Isn't that ironic, you know? Because it finally happened in it. Because we're, 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 we're known for our activism in a time of grief. Um, and I read a story about how after the Newtown shooting with all of those small children and those parents couldn't get laws changed about gun control. But then a few years later, the uh, Orlando Pulse shooting happens. And uh, we've got, this is a photograph of a demonstration in Washington, D.C. after the Pulse shooting against guns and ask and uh, demanding stricter mental health checks on guns if you you can't have one if you if you don't pass us a, a much more comprehensive mental health screening and uh, that's one of the causes that uh, the LGBT community has taken on since the Orlando Pulse shooting so vote this is all a vigil for the Orlando Pulse shooting. And then, you know, I wanted to end with music. Uh, this song by Brandy Carlisle, again, a high, uh, the art we create sometimes gets a lot of attention because the, the sheer talent and magnitude of talent in the LGBTQ community tends to rise to the top and Song of the Year Grammy Award, not 2018 nominee, Randy Carlisle, this song touches upon everything from racism to homophobia, to grief, to loss, to the refugees that are coming here with their children and probably not thinking that they're gonna arrive in America and someone's gonna rip their children out of their arms and put them in cages. But right now, and in recent years, in the Trump administration era, there are LGBT families, same-sex couples with children of their own that are worried that uh, if more laws and rights get overturned, is it possible that their own children could be ripped right out of their arms so they could lose custody because they've lost the ability to be recognized as a married couple and as an actual family? immediate family member. It sounds preposterous, but when you think about the children that are in the cages at the border, is it really that preposterous? Um, so this song, I wanted to close with it. It, it. it touches upon all of those themes in such a magnificent way that it's brought so much comfort and peace to the LGBTQ community and to many other around the world um, and uh, music is an integral part of um, so many tribal cultures, rituals in the morning and grieving process. And again, ours, the LGBT community that tends to be excluded from some of those other more traditional things has their own way of taking high art combining it with activism and making it a very public and a very, very unignorable, um, highly recognized event. So that uh, because of the, we have the talent, the skill and the experience to do just that. And so without further ado, I will end. This is my uh, references with with Brandy Carlisle, if I can actually pull this off, I hope.
So thank you for watching. I hope that even worked. This is a little bit tricky to me the way this, this whole thing happened, but I will, I appreciate you staying to watch the whole video. Um, 
and I don't know where. There it is. I think maybe you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is my references. And that's it. I am completed. I'm going to try to end this.